Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you today in the precious and holy name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to but for a moment say goodbye to our dear sister in Christ, Sister Sherlon. Lord, I pray, God, that you will bring peace, comfort, and joy to this family in this time of sorrow as they grieve the loss of their dear mother, wife, Friend, Lord, she was so much to so many people. And we ask, God, that you will be with each and every one that's here today. Speak to us, Lord, out of your word. Bring words of comfort. Stir our hearts. Draw us close to the heart of Jesus Christ. Prepare us, Lord, so that we too can go and be in the arms of the Savior one day when it's our time. We ask, God, that you'll move in this service today and give us, Lord, what we need as we enter the presence of Almighty God, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.
Yes, John chapter 14 says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again to receive you unto myself, that where I am you may be also. Whether I go, you know, and the way, you know. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whether thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And in John chapter 5, we read the following. John chapter 5, verse 24. The Bible says here in verse 24, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. They shall live. We come today to celebrate the life of our dear sister in Christ, Sister Sherlon Diane Grover, who was born August 13th, 1956 in Wilmington, North Carolina, to Janice Elizabeth Webb, her mother, and she is preceded in death by her father, Tom B. Langley. She is also preceded in death by her brother, Daryl Langley. 
She has survived today by her beloved uh, husband and best friend of 43 years, Earl G. Grover III. Her three children are Earl G. Grover IV, Aunt Andrea Davis Ellison and her husband Xavier, and Jennifer Grover. She also spiritually adopted a son whom she claimed as her own, Rocky Jeter Webb. Her four grandchildren are Josh Guilford, Jasmine Davis Ellison, Brooke, Ad uh, Brooke Adger, and Brielle Adger. Put this over here for me. Her surviving brother is Teron Langley. Her two surviving sisters, Debbie Kidd and Judy Meadows. Also, she had many friends and family members too, men too numerous to mention here. I want to talk a little bit about Sister Sherlon this morning and highlight some things in her life that we all can appreciate and remember and smile over. Sister Sherlon loved to put puzzles together in her free time and absolutely love watching classic TV shows such as The Andy Griffith Show and, of course, Who Couldn't Love the Beverly Hillbillies? I think that's why she liked coming to our church, Brother Earl, because it reminded her so much of the Beverly Hillbillies with the turkeys and the, and the chickens and the ducks and everything that we've got going on out there. You know, we have the greeting choir come and meet you at the door as you're coming in. That's right, that's right. Well, she'll, she'll be here after a while. <laughs> anyway, she also enjoyed having movie night with her family where they would pick out inspirational Bible movies, um, and they would love to watch those as a family. She loved talking about her children and grandchildren. One thing that there can be no mistake about is how much that she loved her children and grandchildren. I have personally witnessed Sister Sherlon shed many tears over you children and grandchildren when she thought you were in trouble. When it was time for prayer requests, she would plead for the church to pray for her children and grandbabies. She loved you very much. You were in her heart always and in her thoughts. A mother's love is very strong and it can never go away. And today it lives in each and every one of you children and grandchildren. Never forget that. Never forget that. Let that love continue to grow in your hearts as you move on with your lives and show others the kind of person she was and is even today as she lives through you. Sister Sherlon was saved while in high school in a revival meeting at Grace Baptist Church. Later, she would follow the Lord's command to be baptized at Camp Dixie. Her favorite scripture verse was Psalm 119, verse 11. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Sister Sherlon attended and was a member of King James Bible Church in Goldsboro, North Carolina, where I pastor. And I must say it was truly an honor and a privilege to be her teacher and preacher. One of my favorite highlights on Sunday mornings was to see her come in, find her seat on the front row, and get ready to hear the Word of God proclaimed out of the Holy Scriptures. One little side note I must mention uh, here. Oftentimes, my sweet mother-in-law... I hope this ain't being recorded. We'll bring breakfast for the church to enjoy, including biscuits and donuts for all to enjoy. And Sister Sherlon would always wait patiently for her to come in. And as soon as she walked through the door, Sister Sherlon would start beaming. Brother Earl had her on a strict diet that included little to no sweets. So to remedy that problem, sorry, Brother Earl, I would distract Brother Earl so Ma could sneak Sister Sherlon some goodies while he wasn't looking. So it all worked out good in the end, and everybody went home happy. Amen. Sister Sherlon had a strong faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And it was this faith that both guided her and sustained her in her daily walk. It was this faith and submission to the Word of God that helped guide both her and Brother Earl through 43 wonderful years of married life 
keeping God at the center of everything that they did. Sister Sherlock was a dedicated wife who loved traveling with her husband, helping him with the veterans ministry home fires burning. She was a loving mother, protecting her children from harm's way, a caring grandmother, and a loyal friend. But most importantly, she was a born-again child of God, washed in the blood of Jesus Christ, the Savior and creator of the world. She loved learning the Bible and hearing it being taught. Now, this morning I want to take some time to talk about her faith in Christ and what that means to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to take a few moments now to visit some of the texts that I read earlier and preach a little while on what it means to be saved and how important it is to make your calling and election sure in the Lord Jesus Christ. Pilate said long ago, he said, Behold the man. Sister Sherlock beheld the man, Brother Earl, and she received him as her Savior. And she was truly born again, washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. And today, she is in the arms of our Savior, resting in the Lord Jesus Christ today. Thank God for it. Amen. Now, we want to talk about that this morning. Jesus said that he was going to prepare a place for us. He said, if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. But there is a condition attached to him receiving you. It is that you believe on his atoning work for salvation. You must believe on him. You must put your faith and trust in Him and what He did for you at the cross. Hearing His Word and believing on Him is the pathway to being born again and being reunited with Sister Sherlon who is in the Lord's presence today. Praise God. John chapter 11 verse 25 states that Jesus is the resurrection and the life. He says, Whosoever liveth, that's those that hear His Word and receive His Word and believe on Him shall never die. You see, Sister Sherlock has not died this morning. She has passed on to be with the Lord. She died when she knelt in an altar and received Jesus Christ as her Savior. That's when she died. And she came up out of that altar a new creature in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. To live and never die again. Praise God. I thank God that Jesus Christ gives us assurance that we can know that we know that we know where we're going when we die and how to get there. The Bible has given us a road map. The Bible has given us the truth and it is up to us to read this book and believe what it says and trust what it says if we're going to make it to heaven. Amen. Sister Sherlock did that. Sister Sherlock did all the dying she was ever going to do when she knelt and trusted Jesus as her Savior. Praise God. Paul says in Galatians chapter 2 verse 20, he says, I am crucified with Christ. You know what he's saying there? He said that when I came and received the Lord, I too was put on the cross and I died with Him. That's my death. Now I live but I live by the faith of the Son of God. I live in the assurance of knowing that He is on the inside of me. Jesus Christ said, I am the resurrection. I am the life. Praise God. And when we pass over into the other world, to heaven, to be with the Lord, it's not a death, it's just a transition. Amen. Amen. It's a transition. We transform to this world, to that world. This body is not Sister Sherlock. This body is what she lived in. Amen. And when she passed on to be with the Lord, one day the Lord's going to come and He's going to take that body and He's going to make it like His glorious body and He's going to reunite her spirit with that body and then they're both going to be completed in the Lord and then we'll have a resurrection day like you've never known. We rejoice forevermore. 
The Bible says, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live by the power of the Holy Ghost. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. That's the key. The Bible further states in Colossians 2.13, And ye being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. I visited Sister Sean in the hospital. I had many talks with her through her battle with different various sicknesses and ailments and things. One thing I can tell you this morning about Sister Sherlock, she was not afraid to die. Her fear was leaving the children behind and making sure that they were taken care of. I can understand that. I have children. I'm not afraid to die. I know where I'm going. (laughs) But what I am concerned about is my children and making sure that they are safe. You see, her, her love for her children kept her holding on to the very end because she wanted to make sure that they were safe. See? But when it was time, the Lord took her hand and took her on into His presence. She was given the assurance at that moment by the Lord Himself, I am, I am assured of it, that these children are going to be taken care of and be saved and their tr- and grandchildren. Praise God. And Brother Earl, because the Lord knows he needs help too. (laughs) Amen. 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 All right. Now, let's go back now and revisit what does it mean to believe on Christ. I don't know who everybody is here this morning. I don't know what background you have. I don't know what religious affiliation you have. But I want to show you this morning from the Bible what the Bible says about believing on Christ. Because a lot of people have a lot of misunderstandings about what exactly does it mean to be saved. What does it mean when you say you're born again? What does it mean when you say you are converted to Jesus Christ? Let me first of all say this. Believing on Christ is not just a mental assent to something. A lot of people believe in Jesus. Amen? I mean, there's a lot. You ask the average person in America, do you believe in Jesus Christ? Most of them will say yes. You know, in some degree or fashion or other, they'll say, yes, I believe in Him. But it's not enough just to believe in Him. See, that's the acknowledgement that He was there. The devil, as the Bible says in James chapter 1, excuse me, chapter 2, verse 19, says that. Thou believest there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe, and they tremble. That's more than some Christians do. (laughs) A lot of Christians today don't tremble over the fact that God is there, He's real, and you could fall into His hands any moment. The devils tremble. But they're not saved. Say, well, preacher, what does it mean then? I'm going to tell you. Glad you asked. To believe on Christ is to trust Him. Put your faith in Him with all your heart. You see, it's a heart conversion that has to take place. That's why it's so important to get young people in church and get them under the preaching of the gospel of Christ because the moment that they hear the truth, a young heart is more apt to receive Christ than an old man. An old man is normally set in his ways. Amen. If he didn't receive it in his youth, outside of a miracle from Jesus Christ himself, he probably won't do it in his old age. But a young person is open to that. See? To believe on Christ is to trust him. That's where the conversion takes place. It starts with the heart and ends with a confession with the mouth. Jesus said in Matthew twelve thirty four, He said, For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth will speak. You can always tell what's in somebody's heart by what they say. And every time I was around Sister Sherlock, she loved the Lord. She loved the Word of God. She loved her children. She loved her husband. She loved being in the church. She loved doing the things of God. You know what that tells me? She was a woman that was born again and converted to the Lord Jesus Christ. Her heart told you what was there. Her mouth confessed it. 
Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Paul emphasizes this in Romans chapter 10. In Romans chapter 10, he says this. It's probably a familiar scripture to many of you, but I'm going to read it anyway. In Romans chapter 10, he says, in verse 8, But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth, watch it, the Lord. Did you catch that? The Lord Jesus Christ. He's not just Lord. He is the Lord. And that's the difference. When you receive Jesus Christ into your heart, you take all those idols that are sitting on the throne of your heart and you kick them out and you put Him on the throne. He's the Lord to the exclusion of all others. In the Old Testament it says, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. Him only shalt thou serve. When we come to the New Testament, Jesus is identified as the Lord God of the Old Testament because He is the one that saved you. See? He says here, He says, What saith it? That thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised Him from the dead. Thou shalt be saved. For with the heart... Man believeth unto righteousness. And with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. You see, you must trust Him with your whole soul. And you must trust Him to get you from point A to point B. Nothing else. If you're relying on Him and Him alone to get you to heaven, that's going to do the job. But let me tell you something. Your church can't get you there. I mean, I'm a pastor of a church. My church can't save you. (laughs) No church in this town can save you. You can join every church in this town and put your name on every register in this town and still go to hell like a bullet. Amen. And uh, your your good works is not going to get you there. Your preacher can't get you there. You got a favorite preacher? Wonderful. Awesome. But if you ain't saved, you're going to go to hell. (laughs) And if your preacher ain't saved, he's going to. Amen. Your preacher can't get you there. You can't get there by your good works. I know a lot of people, when I ask them the question, hey, do you know where you're going when you die? Have you got that thing settled? Have you got that thing uh, fixed with the Lord? Have you had that conversation with Jesus Christ? You know what they tell me? Well, preacher, I'm a good person. Well, that's wonderful. That ain't what I ask you. Jesus said there's none good. How about that? That includes your grandma, your Aunt Sally, and your brother Bill. (laughs) Amen. (laughs) Nobody is good enough to get to heaven. If they were, then Jesus wouldn't have had to die. Amen. Now, I'm a country preacher. I know y'all probably ain't used to this kind of a funeral. But I'm just a plain, uh, they call me uneducated. I got a lot of education, but I don't use it. (laughs) But uh, a plain preacher. You know, I'm a country boy. And I'm going to tell you like it is. If you want to get to heaven, you've got to trust Jesus Christ. If you want to go to hell, trust anything else. Your good works ain't going to get you there. You say, preacher, well, I give up smoking and I give up drinking and I give up all that. That's good, but that's not what's going to save you. You can give all that stuff up. I know a lot of bad people in heaven today that struggle with everything I just listed. And I know a lot of good people that are in hell today because they refuse to yield their heart to Jesus Christ. What's the difference? Yielding. Yielding. A lot of people struggle with things, but that's not the, that's not the issue. The issue is what are you doing with what Jesus Christ did for you on the cross? There's only one thing that can do the job, and that's the blood-stained Savior. The bloodstained Savior. His blood alone atones and justifies us before God. Period. The Bible.
Bible says concerning the precious blood of Jesus Christ, Romans 5, 9 says this, being now justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. It is by His blood that we're saved. Not keeping the Ten Commandments. Not going to the Old Testament law and trying to figure out what we got to do and what we can't do. You can do all the things in the law. You can't keep the law if you tried. The only thing that's going to justify you before God is His blood. According to Romans 5, 9. And if you don't believe that, then you don't believe the Bible. The Bible says in Ephesians 2, 13, We are made nigh by the blood of Christ. That's how you get close to God. You want to get close to God this morning? You want to get nigh to Him? you got to go through the blood atonement. Because that's where it's at. That's the bloodstream that gets you to God. Colossians 1.20 says, Having made peace through the blood of His cross. Peace comes from Jesus Christ. This world is trying to find peace in all the wrong places and all the wrong methods. The United Nations is trying to go around and bring world peace. Uh, that, uh, that religious dictator in the Vatican is trying to run around and bring peace to the world. He holds two fingers up and he says, peace, peace, everywhere he goes. Guess what? Everywhere he goes, there's war, there's conflict, there's trouble, there's suffering. And when he leaves, it gets worse. Peace comes from Jesus Christ, folks. He brings peace. The Bible says being justified by faith, we have peace with God through Jesus Christ. That's how you have peace. People are going around today, these young people are going around today, they're blowing their brains out, they're doing all kinds of crazy things. Why are they doing that? They're doing that because nobody has showed them the way to peace. Sister Sherlock had peace. You know why she had peace? She had peace because she knew the Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ. Praise God. I've had a chance to get to know this family quite well. And I'm here to tell you that one thing I can say about this family, they are dedicated to Jesus Christ and they love the Lord. Praise God for that. Because there's a lot of people, when I stand up and do their services, I'm just not sure where they're at. <laughs> you know? Colossians chapter 1 verse 14 says, We have redemption through His blood. We are told to have faith in His blood in Romans 3.25. Why do you say God emphasized this blood atonement thing? Why did He put such an emphasis on that? I'll tell you why. Because the blood that was flowing through the veins of Jesus Christ was God's blood. That's Acts chapter 20 verse 28 in case you want to read it. I'm recording this message, so if you want a copy of it, I'll get it to you. <laughs> Amen. Acts chapter 20, verse 28 says that it is God's blood that saves you. You see, the very blood we are saved by, justified by, redeemed by, and told to have faith in is called God's blood because Jesus, my friend, the foundation by which everything else is built, Jesus is God manifest in the flesh. He reveals the Father. The Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, He says, great is the mystery of godliness. It's so great that you can't understand it all. You just have to trust what God's Word says about it. Great is the mystery of God. God was manifest in the flesh. 1 Timothy 3.16 It was God that you offended. Think about that. When you sinned, you offended God. So who do you got to be reconciled to? Mickey Mouse? No. Donald Duck? Not along your life. Barney Five? Nope. He's too busy playing with his gun. Listen, it is God that you offended. So it is God that you have to reconcile to. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19, it is God who was in Christ reconciling the world to Himself. 
Now, why are we doing this kind of a message this morning? Because there might be some people here this morning that don't know Jesus Christ. And God tells us to take every opportunity we can to bring that reconciliation so that they too can have eternal life. That is our purpose and mission as Christians. Not just a preacher. Christians. Outside of Jesus Christ, you're lost. And you'll stay lost. And you'll head straight to a devil's hell and no one can keep you from going there but our Lord Jesus Christ. Now that's another subject that people don't like to talk about. But it's a subject that the Bible says very clearly Jesus talked more about hell than he did heaven. And he preached more on hell than he did heaven. And the reason he did was because he wanted to give people a wake-up call to the reality of where they were headed without him. That's why he said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. You can't get there through Mary, you can't get there through the Pope, you can't get there through Allah, you can't get there through Muhammad, you can't get there through your favorite preacher, you can't get there through your favorite commandments that you decide to keep. You must come by the way of the cross. The cross. Paul says, I would know nothing among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. See, Sister Sherlock, if she could come back this morning, she'd tell you, get saved. Amen. Know Jesus Christ. Don't wait until it's too late. Get right and then you can enjoy the benefits of eternal life. John 3.36 says this, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. It's not something you've got to earn. It's something that you receive the moment you trust Him. I was talking to my dad before he died. And I told my dad, I said, Dad, why don't you get saved? We were going to my brother's uh, wedding. I was performing the ceremony. And uh, I said, Dad, why don't you get saved? You're, you're getting older now and I need you to trust Christ as your Savior. And I, I want you to get saved. And he said, well, son, I, I can't get saved until I give up my smoking and I give up my drinking. And I get, he went through a litany of things. I said, Daddy, if you're waiting to get rid of all that stuff to get saved, you'll never get there. You have to come as you are and let the Lord take it from you. And that might be a process or it might be immediate. It's different with different people. I not one time said, hey, you need to quit that drinking. You need to quit that this. You need to quit that. I said, get saved. He got saved on his deathbed. And when he got saved, I was holding him when he died. I visited Sister Sherline just a couple of days before she passed. And I'll tell you something. When you see a saved person leave this world, it's so much different than seeing a lost person leave. Because when that saved person leaves, there's a peace that comes into that place. There's a hush that comes in there. And the presence of God comes in there. And it just wraps itself around you and holds you tight. John 3.36 ends with this though. He that believeth not the Son shall not see life. But the wrath of God abides on him. John 3.18 says, He that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. This is the condemnation, listen, that light is coming to the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. That's why people don't get saved. Because they're holding on to things that they don't want to get rid of. Their devilment. Or they have this illusion this delusion, I should say, that they somehow can convince God to let them in by their goodness. When God's already told you that you stand in condemnation outside of Christ. Amen. The Bible says in John 1, 4, He says, In Him was light, and the light, excuse me, in Him was life, and the life was the light of men. There is no life outside Jesus Christ. Jesus told Thomas in John 14, 6 again, He says, I am the way, not one of many. I am the truth, not one of many truths. He said, I am the life. There's no life outside of Christ. 
He says, no man, and I mean that means the best of the best of them, cannot come unto the Father but by Jesus Christ. There's no back door. There's no side door. (laughs) You have to yield at the foot of the blood-stained Savior and say, please help me, I am a sinner. You see, Jesus Christ came into the world to do what? He came to save Baptist. Is that what it says? No. He came into the world to save Catholics. No, it don't say that either. He came into the world to save Pentecostals. No, he didn't come to save Pentecostals. He came into the world, the Bible says, to save sinners. You know what he did there? He put everybody on the same playing field. He gave everybody a fighting chance to get it right. Because you know what the truth is? We may not want to admit it because we have been brainwashed into thinking we're wonderful people by these fake preachers on TV that tell you how wonderful you are. But let me tell you something. Outside of Jesus Christ, you're blind, you're poor, you're wretched, you're defiled, and you're wicked. And the only way that you're going to get saved is to come to the blood-stained Savior, kneel at the cross, and say, Lord, I am a sinner, and I cannot save myself. Please help me. You see, the man that went to the temple, he went there three times a day along with the Pharisee. And when he came to that temple, he wouldn't even look up. He said, Lord, have mercy upon me, a sinner. And the righteous religious man came to the temple with all his religious credentials. And he said, I thank God. The Bible says he was praying to himself. I thank God I'm not like this man over here. I thank God I'm not like this one over here. I thank God I'm not like this one over here. I do this. I do. And he went through a litany of things. And the Bible says Jesus, when he looked at those two individuals, he said, this one went home condemned, the religious man. But the one that beat his breast and said, God have mercy on me, a sinner, he went home justified. And that's what I want you to do this morning. That would be such a great, honor and tribute to our dear sister in Christ. You see, she wanted me to do this type of service today. She asked me to. She said, when when my time comes, I want you to give an altar call. I want you to preach an evangelistic message. I want you to tell the people the truth about Jesus Christ. I want to give them a chance to get saved. Amen. So I'm here. She picked the right preacher. <laughs> Amen. It's not a list of do's and don'ts. It's not living your best life now. None of that will do. It's not a religion. It's a relationship. It's in a person and that person is Jesus Christ. Paul says again in Philippians 3.10, he says, that I might know Him. Did you get that? That I might know Him. And the power of His resurrection. See, that's what we're talking about this morning. Are you saved today? Think about that. What are you trusting to get you to heaven? Now, now think about that for a minute. Again, I don't know everybody in here. I know some, I don't know others. But I'm asking you a question. What are you trusting to get you to heaven? If, it, if, it, if the answer is anything other than Jesus Christ... You're trusting the wrong thing. Amen. Have you trusted Him to save your soul? Does His blood apply to your heart? Has His blood been applied to make satisfaction for the wrath of God that abides on you if you're not saved? While you're sitting here this morning, I'm asking a question. The wrath of God hovers over you and you're in imminent danger of slipping off into eternity without Jesus Christ if you're not saved. And I plead with you, Sister Sherlock, if she was here, she would plead with you, please yield to the Savior. You are not promised tomorrow. Jesus Christ says, and Paul says through, Jesus Christ says through Paul, he says, Today is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. But I'm telling you folks, the way this world is going, that door is about to shut. The wrath of God is getting ready to be poured out on this world, including the United States of America. We're not above reproach. We've done some vile, wicked things as a country. 
We are pumping things into this country every day. Human trafficking is going on in this country every day. All kinds of wicked, vile things that I can't mention up here today are going on as we speak. In God we trust? Are you kidding? (laughs) We better trust God. We better turn back and get on our face before God and repent and get right with God. Jesus is about to return. Are you ready? He may come through death or He may come through the rapture. But He's coming. And if you're not ready, you're going to be in the world's worst trouble you've ever faced. And I'm pleading with you this morning as I close. Are you saved? Acts chapter 16 verse 31 says this. I'll read it and then we'll close in prayer. Paul talking to the jailer that had just had a eye-opening experience and seen the power of God firsthand when he shook those jail cells open. He comes running in to Paul in verse 31. He says this. He says, uh, and they say, he says, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? It shook him so much that he forgot about his material things around him. He started thinking about his spirituality, where I stand with God. And Paul said this to him, along with the others. He said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. It's believing what God's already done. See, religion says do, 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 and you might get there. Christianity says done, done, done. Trust what's already been done through Christ. Let's bow our heads this morning. Now, I want to ask a question. What are you going to do with our Lord Jesus Christ? Are you going to receive Him? Is there one here this morning? You said, Preacher, you, you, you stirred my heart this morning in the message that you preached. And I, I, I really had to think about some things here. And I'm really not sure where I'm going. But I want to get that settled this morning. I want to get that thing right with the Lord. Say, Preacher, will you pray for me? I'm not saved, but I want to get saved. Let me see that hand. I will not embarrass you this morning. I just want to pray for you. Say, Preacher, I'm not sure where I'm going when I die. Could you please pray for me? I see that hand. Yes, I see that hand. Anybody else? Anybody? Don't leave out of this funeral home this morning. This is the best place in the world to get saved. (laughs) Because that which is dead will become alive. Amen. Are you saved this morning? What are you trusting to get you to heaven? Is there one? Now... While your heads are still bowed and your eyes are still closed, I want to give that person a chance to come forward and I want to pray with them and I want to lead them to Christ if they would. And every head bowed and every eye closed. If you're here and you raise your hand and you want to come forward and and let me pray with you and lead you to Christ, I'd love to do that. This morning it would be an honor. It would be a privilege. And it would be a blessing to the family because it would show... So much blessing for Sister Sherlon's funeral, and it would be a great way to end this service today. Could you come forward? I want to pray with you. I will not embarrass you. I promise you. I tell you what, let me do it this way. While you're sitting at your chair, because you don't have to come forward. You, You can just sit where you are. I want to lead you in prayer to Jesus Christ. I want you to pray this prayer with me. You say, Dear Lord Jesus, I come to you as a lost sinner and I am turning my heart over to you this morning I put my faith in you I put my trust in you going forward and nothing else my faith is in the blood atonement of Jesus Christ as I step out of this building today your word says If I confess with my mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in my heart that God raised Him from the dead, I shall be saved. With my mouth, I confess. With my heart, I put my faith and trust in You and what You did. 
In Jesus' name. Now with heads bowed and eyes closed, I want to see who prayed that prayer. Anybody? Okay, I see that hand. Praise God. Amen. Amen. You are a new creature in Christ Jesus. Now trust Him and let the Lord work in your life. Amen. Now preacher, you say, I was also stirred by this message. I'm saved, but I want to rededicate my walk in life to the Lord Jesus Christ this morning. Is there a hand that can say that? Amen. I see that hand. Amen. Anybody else? I see that hand. Amen. Now, for those who want to dedicate it, you just say, Lord, from this day forward, I am going to be what I need to be for you with the power of the Holy Ghost working in my heart. I'm saved. I'm washed in the blood, but I haven't been doing right and I haven't been walking right. But I'm going to go forward in Jesus' name and rededicate myself to you and my walk with you and my work for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. How many prayed that prayer? Let me see your hands. I see those hands. Okay, praise God. All right. Well, let's close again in prayer this morning. Father, we thank you again for your blessings today. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you, Lord, that you moved in this service today and you stirred hearts. You, you moved people, Lord, to get close to your heart. That's what we are striving to do here is to get people to fall in love with Jesus Christ and to fall in love with this book right here, the Word of God. As we close this part of the service today, I continue to ask that your blessings will be with the family and the friends who are gathered here to pay tribute and bring honor to Sister Sherlon. And we thank you, Lord, for what you've done here today. As we close, we ask God that you'll be with them and minister to them and continue to bring comfort and peace to their hearts through the coming days. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, let me close by saying to the family, um, it was an honor and a privilege to be here today. And thank you for allowing me to do this service. And I want you to know that our thoughts and our prayers are with everyone here that is family and friends. And we will continue to pray for you. She was a dear sister in Christ. We grew to love her so much. And we're going to miss seeing her on that front row looking for those biscuits. And uh, we, we, um, we love her. And uh, thank God we had the uh, opportunity and the time to be with her. And if you need anything from us, you let us know, okay? All right, then. We'll do the next song. We'll be dismissed after this song.
Amen. All right. Bless you, my friend. Prayers are with you, okay? Bless you, sweetheart. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Bless you. Bless you, my friend. Bless you, sister. If you need anything, let us know, okay? Get up here where sister Linda is. All right, sister Linda. Bless you, sweetie. All right. Thank you for saying something. Yeah. Thank you. God bless you, my brother. God bless you. Thank you for the salvation message, too. Amen. Right. That's what we needed. My, uh, my fiance right here, she's... Is right she there? Yes, yeah, she's right here. Oh, so, hello. This, this Pastor Mark right How here. are you, sister? I'll be sending you guys some more CDs, okay? Yes. And this All right. One is, uh, brother's right here. I do. Please do. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, sweetie. God bless you. And I'll be praying for you, okay? Thank you. Be strong. Sweetheart, it's good to see you. God bless you. God bless you. Amen. Yeah. God bless you, my buddy. How are you? All right, baby. Appreciate you. Good morning, morning my brother. Yes, sir. God bless you. God bless you, brother. You honor this man, but you honor the Lord first of all. God bless you, man. Amen. I like that preaching. Yes, sir. Thank you. Keep us in your prayers. Amen. God bless you, folks. I wanted to say goodbye to you yes. before y'all left. Okay. Yes. God bless nice you. Cousin. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Our, cousin, our father and Carol's father were brothers. Were you? Oh, okay. All right. Wonderful. That's awesome. Well, it's nice to meet y'all. Nice yes. to meet you as well. Yes. All right. God bless you, sister. God bless you, hon. You did a great job. Thank you, honey. Oh, okay, <laughs> wonderful to meet you. Nice to meet you, sweetie. Thank Hi. you. How you doing? Great job. You're doing Thank great. You, Thank you, sweetie. I appreciate you. Okay. I'm going to speak to her again. So tell her. Thank you. So, tell, so, so we'll get you some more uh, CDs and everything, okay?